Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever and whenever you are. Welcome back to another Friday Fireside from the Happy Startup School. Uh, conversations we hope will, that will inspire, uh, empower and maybe connect those of you who follow our work, those of you who are interested in doing um, work that makes money, uh, does good in the world, but also avoids burnout for you. Uh, and on that topic of doing purposeful work and doing it in a way that is sustainable, I was curious to invite uh, John uh, to tell his story of, of the business he's running, his work, how it started, how it's gone, um, to well, hopefully give him a space to just reflect. You know, uh, I think it's always helpful when we can uh, weave some meaning into the madness that has been our businesses. Uh, but also, I'm hoping with that, maybe those of you listening and watching will find something helpful for you, or at least at one level, feeling like you're not on your own when you're trying to do this kind of work. John, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the the business, Parla, um, and a little bit of how it started. You know, what was before Parla, and how did that transition into Parla happen? Okay, and first of all, thank you both for inviting me uh, to this. Um, yeah, so I just wind the clock back a little bit. I before Parler, I worked at Microsoft um, in the UK, and my role there was uh, a creative strategist, which probably means nothing to to, to many people. Um, but basically, it was sort of getting paid to dream, uh, daydream a little bit um, for sort of branding and marketing ideas for clients of Microsoft and this would be advertising and it would be across Microsoft platforms. So you're going as far back as MSN, uh, Skype and all those kind of things that we probably don't use anymore. Uh, but more, you know, there's Xbox and, and I think Windows Phone at the time and, and various you know platforms that they bought there. And it was a it was a very comfortable role. Um, I was getting paid a good amount of money for say for, for thinking a lot <laughs> and uh there's no such thing as a bad idea so even if the idea wasn't good you, you know in terms of qualifying it uh um i didn't always have to qualify if, if somebody didn't go with an idea it wasn't it wasn't the end of the world and but it was too comfortable and i think um for me i just sort of started to look at the dynamics of what i was doing and if you broke it down at its rawest level I was just taking money from one big corporate and giving it to another big corporate and just swilling that money around a, a you know this sort of profitable economy and and it didn't sit right for me um at least at that stage in my life and so yeah i was uh i was there for about eight or nine years and then it got to a point at which i just knew i had to put some actual purpose into my work i wanted to have a more direct impact i was quite privileged to be in that position at microsoft um and I felt that there was an opportunity there for me to actually go out and do something for myself. And uh, there was a chance to take uh, voluntary redundancy, which I took, and I used that uh, to sort of kickstart my next phase. Um, and that was around 2016. So Parler launched in 2016. But as an idea, I mean, I registered the company back in 2011. So it had been festering as a concept. Um, and I guess I was sort of, as most sort of business startups go, you kind of just sort of side by side for some time until you feel there's the right opportunity. And as I say, that, that opportunity to take redundancy felt like that opportunity. And so, yeah, I launched uh, Parler in 2016, but obviously had to do a lot of pre-work before that because um, in terms of how Parler came about, it wasn't like I was coming from a fashion industry, uh, far less the eyewear industry um i've been traveling I'm fortunate to be tra uh, able to travel in in africa in some of my uh, earlier travels and uh, and and had a real affinity for the places i've been to the people i've met um the cultural experience but learned about the, the complete lack of access to eye care um so sort of simultaneously and i felt that there was is such a you know a pair of glasses is recognized as one of the most cost effective poverty alleviating tools you can give someone and yet in parts of africa you just in some countries you just can't access that um there's a project we were we were currently funding in sierra leone um and uh sierra leone is a country of just under eight million 
and it has just five optometrists for eight million people. So that gives you, you know, in an acute way, the, the the problem at hand. And I just felt that there was there was something that we could get behind and and try and uh, form a way of communicating that. And um, so I had no uh, background in in eye care. So actually, my first meeting was with Vision Action, a charity based up in Gatwick. And I said, well, look, you guys work in Ghana, Ethiopia, Zambia, um, Sierra Leone. Um, if you can help me facilitate change on the ground, um, I'll go away and think of a company to, to leverage that uh, change and, and, um, and bring, bring funding through. And that's when I thought, well, look, let's keep this simple for people, <laughs> not realizing how complicated it would be for me. Uh, let's create an eyewear brand, which will mean if we sell sunglasses, uh, eyeglasses, then, and then we can deliver um, change through supporting vision centers and building vision centers in parts of um, Africa. Uh, and so that's where it really started. It didn't come from a, I've got a great product or a brand idea here. I've actually got a cause. And then I retrofitted a, a business around that. Fascinating. Um, so one thing that springs to mind around just the the focus that you had, pardon the pun, but um, you mentioned some there about uh lack of um i can't remember the term you used but eye care or eye support and vision support is one of the one of the leverage points around um, alleviating poverty is that what you said something like yeah that? yeah yeah and so there's there's something what i'm hearing is something quite strategic around the purpose around this is like actually we solve this specific problem it can have quite amplified effects in terms of uh, helping others, a hundred percent. So, uh, I, I, you know, again, I've been to um, watch some of our work in Ethiopia, and I've been to Zambia as well to to see the the work out there. And whether you're giving a pair of spectacles or corrective surgery to a child, it means at school they can read the blackboard, they can read books. But equally for an adult, the same same thing. They can read a book. But um, in Ethiopia, which is quite a a high sort of cotton sewing based industry if you can't sort of thread a needle because you can't see the hole and put the put the thread through then again you you can't you know you it's an obstruction to working so yeah a pair of glasses is 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 a, is a huge tool of benefit and it's 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 the zambia project for example we we, we funded a um a refurbishment and a and the equipping of a vision center in 2017 and um since then, there's 28,000 people have passed through that vision centre. So um, maybe it's something we go on to in a bit. But one of the things of closing a business is it's not just gone and disappeared forever. Um, there's a legacy there of, of 28,000 people who will benefit from the gift or, of better vision and, and the economic advantages that will give them going forwards. That's great. No, I, I like, well, I, hopefully, well, we will touch on this idea of legacy and, and what it means for the journey of, of of building a business that can be quite challenging um i think the the lesson or the lesson the thing that's really stuck out for me is this idea of how uh, i get the impression sometimes when we think about doing purposeful work changing the world for the better it can be quite big stuff that needs to happen. lots of things quite a complex array of things that need to happen uh and being able to have some level of focus fi finding a leverage point finding a story that if I do this bit and do my work here, it can have its ripple effects so that you don't get overwhelmed with all the things that you need to do. Um, and and, there's, and like you said before, there's a simple story, which I think is also lent to the brand that, that makes e easier to connect the dots as to why this doing this, buying this impacts, makes an impact in a certain way. Yeah, agree. You've, you've, yeah, one of the learnings I'd say is, is, for running a small business or a startup is you've just got to simplify everything and make it easy for customers to understand the communication of what you're doing. I think if you get, you know, go across too many different parts of sustainability or, um, or, per, um, you know, uh, people are impact on, on people, then, then the messages get confused and people don't quite know what you're doing. And, and also there's a lot of, there's a lot of greenwashing out there and a lot of tree planting mm -hmm. going on and stuff. And actually, for us, it was our raison d'etre. It was it was about having a, a cause that we could get behind, but go out 
and you know we've got some beautiful video and photography from that and authenticate it and people can really see what they're doing what the impact is of what they're doing rather than just sort of say oh we're doing this that and will we give this extra percentage of our our our, our revenue to this or that it's hard for people to really get behind something when it has when you can't really see or touch what what's going on so it's very important that whilst it was a a single-minded idea that we we also made sure that people could see for themselves that impact and the understanding of of um what they were contributing towards Brilliant. lawrence do you have any questions or comments um well no just what struck me was what you said really the idea that if you think of wanting to alleviate poverty in Africa as a as a mission, then that's like setting yourself up for a, a failure in some ways. But like you said, starting with that that kind of uh, entry point, like you said, is is feels doable and it feels uh, feels empowering because it's maybe not sexy in some ways, but something that actually, like you said, creates a ripple effect. And I think a lot of people we meet want to change the system or change like the impact with a big eye. And it can almost stop you starting because it feels so weighty that you just don't know what your bit of it is. And so therefore you don't know where you can actually make a difference. But I love True. this idea of starting with retrofitting the business around the cause rather than coming up the product and then trying to find a purpose to sort of weave into the story. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, and the, obviously the importance out of this is partnerships. So working with Vision Action, we would never be able to, you know, we can't just turn up and mm. start, you know, distributing glasses uh, or, or spectacles through uh, vision centers, you know, vision action are, are the people on the ground. And I went out on their outreach programs, have a very good relationship with them. We get the stories back and they're authenticated. So it's, yeah, you have to kind of get really down and connect mm. to, to the, the charity or the NGO that you're, you're working with in order to make sure that um, all is qualified and valid. Cause I say, you don't want to get sort of, roped into this sort of world of greenwashing and mis misinformation um, mm. about your brand. Because, um, yeah, people, who, there's a lot of cynical people out there. And I think uh, you have to kind of really push through that and say, no, this is us, this is what we do, and this is how we authenticate it. Cool. Um, so I'm just going to give a bit of a context to how I'm thinking about this conversation. And one of the, a core thing of what we do at Happy Startup School is this group coaching program called Vision 2020. And we kind of question, we invite people to define what success means. And there's four quadrants, four areas that we like to look at, impact, connection, time, and money. And so hearing your story about the, really focusing on uh, eye health and eye care and how that can really create an impact in terms of the well, you know, financial well-being of people sounds so clear as a story and then you started talking about having partnerships and so i'm curious here from the lens of connection from the lens of having collaborations how did how did you navigate that because one of the challenges i think a lot of people have is we either force a collaboration or they start on a basis that doesn't doesn't continue for whatever reason and it sounds like with your work you managed to find the right people to work with. And I was just curious about what, how that went about. What did that mean? What was it about that relationship that was so, um, that had longevity for a better term? I mean, I think from Vision Action's point of view, it was quite, quite an easy conversation to have. So um, I looked for, a, a, you know, I literally went on to Google and thought, right, what charities work in eye care in Africa? And, and they were one of the leading ones. And, um, went to their office and it was literally a conversation of, look, if, if you can provide me the visibility and, and the absolute transparency of where funding from Parler goes, I'll go away and send the money your way to do that. And from their point of view, that was great. And we, we put a, a, an agreement in place uh, and a commitment to that. And, um, but it's, yeah, it's about meeting, uh, it was you know, meeting quarterly and having quarterly calls to understand the impact. And if we were going to go on some, some uh, journeys with them and uh, to, to some of their locations and, and understand the content that we could record and, and share again. Um, and they've been really supportive and they put us in their newsletters. And obviously we reach out to opticians that way. So there's, there's value of, of visibility of, of working with a charity partner there. But equally, we worked with uh, an NGO 
in Ghana called uh, Care for Basket, um, and they uh, worked with weaving communities uh, in a, in a place called Bolgatanga. Um, I always wanted Parla as much as possible to, to sort of touch back to Africa. So our cases were made in in Ghana um, out of recycled plastic waste. Um, and uh, normally the community we would use straw, but unfortunately from climate change, that's shifted a lot further south down country. So for the women, I had to go on a bus, go out into the bush, come back, and it's sort of, you know, three hour journey. And obviously the dangers, inherent dangers of, of traveling alone to gather your materials. So we provided recycled plastic waste and water sashes as well. There's an endemic problem there in Ghana that the water bed's been poisoned by pesticides from the 60s and 70s. Um, so you can't drink out of a tap, you drink out of a water sachet. And um, so they get thrown on the ground. You probably drink 10 or 12 of those a day and throw them on the ground. But actually, what we've done is by using water sachets in our cases, um, you're putting a value on those sachets and therefore uh, they're not thrown on the ground, they're collected and used as a material. Mm. And that's, uh, again, a sort of a success side to business. I'm, I'm as proud of as almost as the sunglasses because, um, again, it was about uh, paying these uh, weavers uh, a good sum of money so that actually it was about, so, so they could pay for hospital fees and school fees and not just as subsistence income and again we heard wonderful stories from that um uh, whether it is being able to to afford a bike to go to the well and pick up water and, and cycle back again and and when we were over there in 2018 uh, i met all the weavers and um we took polaroid snaps of every single one so 130 photos it was really interesting because obviously a <laughs> no one had ever seen a photo just sort of appear in front of them uh uh and b nobody had a photo of themselves so it was it was a really all valuable commodity to the point that uh a couple of years ago one of the weavers died unfortunately um and i had a funeral they didn't have a photo of her but they did have that photo which they blew up and used and put it across in a pitch frame on her, her coffin so really small things from our point of view but it just shows you how how valuable um this can be um i've, I've slightly got <laughs> i've just realized i've gone off on a complete tangent. No, that's okay that's i always okay. do this this is my creative brain going ping 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 fizz fizz sorry so I, well it definitely for me talks to a part of emergent quality to this journey you know starting off with that very clear focus around eye care and then seeing how the impact could also be created through creating the cases ethically and sustainably um what I was curious about as well was, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've got an assumption there's lots of different charities around and lots of different charities and organizations that are trying to do stuff in Africa. It sounded like this particular one was well established, but is there anything here around the relationships you built with those people? You know, how that worked, the trust, the understanding? I don't know. It's just I'm just curious about how you chose who to work with. Was it purely based on the impact they could create or was there any kind of the way you communicate did it how how was it about the relationship you had with the people who were within these organizations um i mean the truth is with vision action they were based close by so there was i wanted to work with a charity that i could visit and see and speak across the table have a coffee with and and, and form a, a good relationship that way um careful basket which obviously where i went off on a tangent but my point being is that i that was using the network to to find a, a guy called jib hagen who runs that and he's based actually quite close by in in worthing um that was a sort of um a slightly different scenario but again working closely with him uh we have a wonderful relationship he brings lots of vegetables over to me from his vegetable patch um i've just got him fixed up with some some frames uh at his local opticians and we just yeah, he he'll always he's he's always been bright and selling his woven baskets, and it's just um, it's just a really nice human to human connection that we have. And Jib will be a friend for life. It's um, you know, whilst we won't be necessarily doing cases with him going forwards, it's a wonderful. He's a wonderful man. He came to my fiftieth birthday last year, um, and he's just the biggest. He's got a light with made out of plastic with strap. Sorry, a light. He's got a hat made with lots of plastic strands coming down with a solar panel and lights hanging off. He's the most eco person you'll ever meet, and um, he's just got a wonderful temperament. And that relationship, you you couldn't, I could never have sought that relationship. It was a it's a connection of a connection of a connection kind of thing, and it just happened. And you have to feel very lucky that that happens from time to time. And uh, yeah, he's a wonderful man. 
Oh, that's, that's wonderful. It's lovely just to hear, hear that you, this idea of a lifelong friend that's coming from this journey. Um, I also, you know, this is interesting that you said there's something around the proximity of these people, this accessibility. They were nearby. I could talk to them rather than, you know, going so far away or, or, or making it hard. It's like people who are within your circles of connection or close by as a way to start this thing off to make it as easy as possible i'm assuming yeah yeah i mean yes yeah, so you can you can look at other parts of the business when we first started producing uh frames it was initially it was in china with ethically altered factories but the communications are so difficult and the time it took to get things done was was really complicated from so from a supply chain level, that was really hard to do so maybe yeah having having elements of 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 parlor operating within the uk did make things a lot easier so all our packaging and print and all that kind of stuff was done locally um our frames are made in italy um, um now or been last two or three years uh but again communication is hard and but i i I'd go there once or twice a year and, and stay with them for a weekend and and properly sort of have a conversation with them and they would be brilliant. Uh, the, the family, it's only a very small, uh, small family-run business, and and they wouldn't let me pay for anything, and and feel I felt thoroughly entertained, and and they'd invite all their family around and have a nice big lunch in the garden, sort of thing. So, uh, again, they feel like friends as opposed to business, and and I don't know if that's a good approach to take to business is is uh, see everyone as friends as opposed to business because maybe that makes him more of a softer kind of business person in terms of a business head and. Um, but I've never been someone to, to challenge really on price too much. I've always felt that if that's what people need to earn, then that's what uh, that's what I should pay them. Um, and uh, yeah, that's mm. that's it's uh, feels to me to be the fairest way. And as a B Corp, again, you you have to look into all this part of your supply chain and and um, how you pay people and how you make sure you pay people correctly. So um, yeah, I'm not I'm probably not the best at being <laughs> Well, I'm just not a super aggressive person when it comes to to business decisions in terms of really. I know there's people out there trying to hammer down their customers or their not their customers, but their supply chain and suppliers on on pricing. Something I didn't do, and I just felt that was part of being an ethical business. Uh, mm. That uh, I did that. Well, let's put it so you're you're not being radical by uh, amongst us by saying it'd be nice to have friends as well as business. Um, partners so <laughs> that's definitely aligned in terms of our way of thinking still in this area of connection <clears throat> i wanted to move on to this idea of stories and branding um because the way i understood your approach is very much about the brand not necessarily just about the product um so maybe just talk us through that approach and and what that meant because i've really heard a really clear story about the impact how did that trans? How how did that translate into how you built the brand of Parler and the things that you had to think about and the way you went about it? Mm. I mean, as a brand, basically, um, I wanted Parler to be uh, an easy vehicle for people to make a choice uh, for their eyewear. So uh, it, it's very you know, sort of the, the days of people in the street collecting money for for charities and in boxes i think is sort of seems to be long gone it doesn't seem to be a thing that people do really anymore and so i wanted to make it easy uh, you know sustainability and and is still a very small bubble i unfortunately i believe is in terms especially in fashion it's a hard one to crack it's um you know sustainable fashion isn't uh inexpensive when it comes to purchasing and a lot of the population don't have the money to to be able to afford sustainable fashion that's just the way it is at the moment with the way it works you need some of the bigger companies out there to go you know to, to come through and actually you know sort of sort of their supply chains on out and, and and bring down the overall cost in in uh in 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 their sustainable fashion as well as obviously pushing on government as well to make it encourage small business like us to to survive and thrive because it's all very well saying it's sustainable but actually being a sustainable business to sustain itself is a is a is a far um harder act to follow um so sorry again i've gone slightly off on a tangent the question was <laughs> it, it, i think it's more about the stories that you're telling how you yeah. went about that what, what that process was for you um because is there something around here 
I, I you know one of our close friends, Anne Milton Berg, runs an organization called Brand the Change, uh, and it is about harnessing this this power of brand building to make purposeful change. Uh, and so, uh, for those of listening who may be just getting stuck in the weeds of the execution mm -hmm. and the doing, and maybe even just the money side of things, what was it that helped you by building a strong brand, and what does building a strong brand mean to you yeah sorry so so for me it is it is very much having backing yourself up in terms of having the content to authenticate yourself as a a brand for good or business for good um you say sustainable or good fashion it has been hijacked especially in the fashion space uh it has been hijacked a lot and we can we couldn't trade on being a sustainable business anymore because everyone was saying they're sustainable is sustainable that so we had to very much um trade more on our africa africa piece which which because we, we do sustainable eyewear it was all made from bioacetate biodegradable and all our packaging was great and and you know no plastic but in terms of um the brand building it really has to be around um just trying to get as much content as you can to say why you are part well, what's your point of difference um and why and you also need to talk from the, the heart it's quite interesting in our last sort of you know in our closing sort of six to seven weeks of of business i actually put myself more front of the business uh with a lot more especially on LinkedIn and, and, and um, on our Instagram and socials and lo and behold, we got a lot more traction that way. So I think what I didn't, well, that trade-off while you're running your business, you don't have the time to, to be able to do that extra bit of content. But obviously as, as time became more released, I found myself able to say, okay, there, we, we've got a, a sale on our, you know, I'll talk about the sale and how it's going. And then people really engage with that. And uh, I guess that's a learning, um, which is to give more time to, to if you want to, but to put yourself out there as the face of your business. That is actually a, a point of difference between all the other eyewear brands. Um, eyewear brands, quite funny, cliquey face to be in, and nobody really tends to put their face out there. They just hide behind their product. Um, but again, I think if you're a small company and you're trying to cut your teeth and trying to break through, then actually showing your own personality and your again your authenticity it's all very set well saying we're doing this great all these great things uh on your website but who's the person behind this and, and what are they saying about it and it does this marry up in my head and i think when you show that um what you're saying is marrying up with what the founder is saying to the comms their own personal comms to you then i think again that adds real weight to uh, a customer's uh opinion on a on a brand Hmm. Ironic. Uh, eyewear brands and the uh, founders being invisible. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence, did you so, have any? Well, I was just going to ask. Do you, so knowing that, do you feel like you would have done things differently at the start and be a bit more visible as a founder at the start? Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm sure like... there's lots of things you change. But we would, but yeah, just. Yeah. No, I, I think I would have done. It's it's a, it's a personal tasting, though. It's. Um you kind of get this trade-off you, if you kind of put yourself in front of the brand does it feel a bit more cottage industry a bit sort of young mm. and not too confident in itself or you know a lot of the bigger more developed brands you don't really see the founders and i think that's maybe a, 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 a it's a personal decision maybe it depends what industry you're in mm. as well as to what you decide to do but for us maybe that could have been uh one of the things that may have helped to accelerate more sales and obviously all the benefits that come with that it may not have done it just you know it might have been the mm. last six or seven weeks people just feeling a bit more sympathetic and we got help you know we did a you know we did very well in the last six seven weeks of sales um i'm not saying that's directly attributed to me by any stretch probably because the fact that the, the frames are half price but um i think you just have to make that judgment for yourself as to whether mm. you feel that um your per your own personal brand personal you know brand john or whatever it is is valuable for the business and not to let that take over yeah your 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 branding either you don't want to be too front and center because you're you know you are your own people have different tastes to who that person is and you don't want to kind of dominate that and, and let that take over from your brand either well first to me you made the story about the cause rather than your story yeah 
I'm, yeah. I'm wondering about just on this point about having your face there is what that does in terms of trust and whether having a human face there um, helps with that more than just having a logo, particularly as, as when you're a particular size, not huge. I would say so. I would say so. I mean, um, I'm a, a follow Finnis there, for example. Tom K, obviously the founder, mm. he goes onto their socials now and again and does some pieces. I think it's it's a nice interruption of what you normally see on the scroll. Uh, it just reinforces, I think, um, when you hear it coming from the founder's voice or even an employer. It doesn't have to be the founder if you're bigger than that. I think, uh, especially with your socials, I think you can be a bit, bit more liberal with, with people talking about the business. Um, I think there's a probably get their name on, but is it Brudillic, which is a distillery um, up in Scotland? Um, and their services are great. Um, and different employees put stuff up there. So you get a real sense of the family feel of that company. And again, I think if I think that's a really nice for me, that's I'm attracted to their social media for that. They're not just putting up bottles of uh, their whiskey um, as a, as a, because that's actually quite boring to, to keep looking at. But when you hear the opinions of, so and so, who works in I don't know, in the the driver of one of their lorries, and it just just makes you feel more connected to the to the brand and the business because it's it, you're you're hearing real human lives and um, real people behind that company. And it's not just like a facade of you know, sort of um, imagery and 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 slick kind of websites. Um, so I'm going to go into the next sort of area, which is about money. Uh, profit, um, financial sustainability, but also how it feels to make money. Um, tell me a bit more about what that meant for Parler and how how you were navigating that and the things that you had to, the challenges that you may have faced. Yeah, I, I think uh, again the way I had no experience setting up a business, so, um, but I think in 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 creating a sustainable and ethical business. Um, so particularly one which is quite supply chain heavy, um, you tend to invest a lot of time in, in getting that correct. And as I say, you, you, it's all about fair pay. So um, again, my sort of costs, costs or my cost price for my product compared to my peers in the same space was incredibly high. Um, and I should have been selling my sunglasses a lot higher actually, um, but I didn't want to, the whole reason, I wanted Parler to be an aspirational brand for sort of middle income earners who would maybe spend 50, 60 quid on a frame. But actually, if they spent you know, a little bit more, they'd get a really high quality frame and they'd get the, the ethical and the sustainable purpose that comes um, with the brand. There's something here around you've got the story, you've got the brand, you then got the pricing and you got the costs. You know, there's the profit to make it financially saleable. And then within that lens of pricing, there's like people will pay, different people will pay different amounts of money for the same product, you know, 100%. depending on who you target. And, you know, I heard you say before, it's like, you know, when we, when we half the price, things are flying off the shelves kind of thing. So I'm just curious about how your thinking evolved over the time of, running a purposeful business so there's you can't well it feels like ethically you are not there to just squeeze suppliers down no that is something mm -hmm. what you can do but so if that is here then on the sales side it needs to be somewhere higher and so yeah. how did that evolve thinking evolve for you and was part of that also in terms of the importance of building the brand and, and the story yeah i mean in the early days it was uh it was almost like look and feel in terms of how we are uh, in terms of pricing. I mean, when Parler first started, when we were working out of China, it was 45 pounds for a frame. Thought, great, we'll just be online, do I wear online and there'll still be enough margin, not, not much, but enough margin to, to, to make sales, et cetera. And these are my projections, aren't they, aren't they great? And then you realize, especially with eyewear, I think uh, people like to um, try it on. And so you need to start wearing, uh, working with stockists. So we worked with stockists, but then obviously they need their margin. And then actually uh, from 45 pounds, I had to make my, you know, my sunglasses had to be 80 pounds, for example, just to make sure that the stockists got their, get, got their piece. Um, and then 
we started working with polarized frames and we started working in Italy and then all of a sudden you're sort of pricing at um, uh, 125 to, to 160 pounds, which is where we got to. Um, and but even then, it wasn't it wasn't it actually wasn't commercially right for us. If you play by the normal conventions of pricing, we should have been 200 pounds plus for a frame. And but I wasn't prepared to compromise that for our customers. <laughs> I wanted it to still be aspirational for middle income earners, not for the preserve of an echelon of society who probably buy five frames and not think anything of it. So it was a real, I got caught in a, in a space there, which um, I didn't particularly like. And, and it was a conundrum that I hadn't found an answer to other than just keeping on putting up prices on frames. And that kind of didn't, that wasn't really something I, what I wanted to do because <laughs> I knew that I'd be ostracizing the, the audience. So I always wanted to, ch to make it available for in the first, for, uh, in the first place um so yeah it's it was it was uh it's one of those things you learn over time and i'm sure there's people with small businesses and pricing is one of the hardest things to get right um especially when there's so many components in supply chain and especially when it's the last couple of years with with inflation and that impact and again having to keep putting your re retail prices up to to accommodate that it's it is definitely as you can see from 45 pounds to the polarized frame now to 160 pounds in the space of seven years normally it goes the other way normally people start high and go low i've actually <laughs> i've kept on going up um and trying to find that space for for for, for right pricing um it's good but it, the problem being it you know there is margin in it but um if you've got you know to, to for all the overheads of the business i still wasn't able to make a profit and in seven years not making profit um I'm sure there's people that will be aware. It puts a lot of financial pressure on yourself. I, ha I did have an investor, um, but equally that brings its own pressure as well. Um, and you have to, we were closing the gap. Um, we were sort of, you know, we, we were probably two, two years away, I'd say from uh, getting to sort of parity in terms of profit, um, which should have been like year nine. And it's interesting because a lot of, Sustainable, and I've spoken to a lot of other sustainable businesses, especially in the product space. And some have gone disappeared the last couple of years, even B Corps that I know. Um, but other ones, it's, it's taken 10 years, 12 years, 14 years. I think even finished there, it was, it was sort of year 13 or year 14 before they made profit. And I think it's one of the learning things is, is you've got to be really patient. Um, when I first sat in front of my investor, I had these projections at year three, we'd be doing £150,000 of profit. And is the reality is it's it's just not that. Um, you, you forget how difficult, uh, you know, there is a lot of competition. Sunglasses is a huge competition out there. It's, there's a company called Luxottica in Italy. 75% of all frames in the world are made from there. So you go to Sunglasses Hut, all those different brands, Purcell, Prada, Tom Ford, Oakley, they all come, they're all licensed to the same factory. So that's why there's a real monopoly in the industry and it's really hard to break that especially with opticians the opticians will have great deals with luxottica they're probably buying their frames half the price that i could go to them with so that market is a really skewed market so it does make it very hard for you to compete in that space <clears throat> so you're saying here around you know it takes time um you potentially two years away from profitability um uh, finished air taking 13 years it does help me transition nicely into this final topic time um time it takes to get the business sustainable in this case but also how you want to spend your time because if it's only two years away you could have waited around two years but there was something that you made a decision to say no that's not enough i i can't wait that long so talk to us a bit more about in this case the winding down of Parla and this idea of like what it meant in terms of your your time and your energy yeah i mean there's a you know when when you first start your business that day day one of trading you're a very different person to the person that comes out seven years later um there's all this hope expectation i so say you got these kind of most falsified figures of, of where you think the sales are going to go uh, ignoring the fact that uh, just getting a return on advertising uh, available across any platform is is nigh on impossible uh, or seemingly um, 
Uh, and you, you know, I would, I wanted to use all my creative abilities and all these kind of things that uh, I was strong at. But as you kind of sort of grow, the, you know, as year, years go by, you end up being pulled in, and, and the business sort of starts to to grow. You end up getting pulled into many parts of the business, um, and parts of the parts of which I'm not particularly strong at, and um, operations, I'm not particularly strong at that. Um, I'm more of a, you know, my background was marketing, stroke sales, stroke creativity, and that's that's great, but that's only a small part of of running a business. And eventually, you become a a jack of all trades, but master of none is what I'd probably consider myself. And uh, and again, sort of year five, six, and even seven, you're kind of you feel like you're just constantly firefighting. You'd love to be able to, you'd love to be able to just um, focus on what you're good at um and uh but you don't and you end up facing all the stuff you're not good at and it takes a lot of time and therefore time is something you lose completely um i, I always work bank holiday mondays i saw that as a, a day of which i would be catching up a little bit i was kind of laughing to myself going oh great i'm i'm actually uh i'm winning today because nobody else is working today so i'm actually gonna and this is a crazy thought um I should be taking bank holiday Mondays and I'd work, you know, the weekends and uh, I've got a thing what I used to do. I called it sushi Monday, which is like I'd work Mondays nine till nine and I'd get, get half price sushi at half nine when I went home. All these stupid things that I kind of conditioned myself to do. And actually, uh, when you're in there, you just don't even you don't you don't even notice it. But it creeps. It's creep. But what you, you do notice the signals because friends or relationships or all that kind of stuff start coming back and, and noticing it and you start getting oh okay yeah actually I should have I should have done this or that and you stop being proactive in your life outside of work you just react you know I'm suddenly it's Friday evening and I've, I've not even thought about what I'm doing so it, it does control you somewhat and I, I and you know I wish I could scale and bring people in to be able to do the those bits well but that's a that's a cost to the business and uh so you're you're putting more pressure on again on the business because scaling is one of the hardest things to do you've got to get it right but you don't want to have a person doing this and, and another person doing that and then suddenly you've got fifty thousand pounds of extra revenue you've got to find um just to cover that and so again it's probably one of those huge um elements of, of a startup uh, of the struggle of a startup is to know when to to get that timing right and i'd say we i mean i never went beyond two people in the business in seven years so a full-time people and that probably is an indication of never being confident enough to saying to my investor okay look can you put some money behind us so we can have two people here this person can do operations this will, and this person can do something else and and that will give me all the sales and this will give me the space the headspace to do the founder stuff because the founder stuff kind of goes quite quickly because you're not able to you haven't got the time to do that that side of the business and that's the stuff that's going to separate you from the competition ultimately is by being creative and maybe doing really good collaborations with people and being really insightful about that and yeah it disappeared and um but you also don't realize it's happening as well it's it's a, it's a whole little thing it sneaks up on you and so look i had a i had a meeting with my investor about seven weeks ago and and um there was quite an obvious a conversation it was quite obvious that i probably wasn't getting any more investment and um part of my go to him was i needed to pay myself more and again as many people work small businesses know that you only try and pay yourself enough to allow the business to thrive but it got to the point my own personal financial situation was tricky and you're kind of thinking about your mortgages and i had to sort of say to him that i need to i need to pay myself more each month because i actually can't i can't survive beyond the next two or three months and so but there was a line in the sand on that and it wasn't forthcoming so it actually made the decision easy for me i'm glad there was a line that i couldn't cross rather than trying to I say two years rather than trying to cling on to this hope um, it was good. There was some, some certainty in that. Uh, and I know that I can now try and prepare. Um, I think I've got it written down, prepare my panic or plan my panic, um, for the next two or three months to, to, to make sure I can earn income in the short term to, to sustain myself and then focus on, okay, brand JP, so brand John, not JP, brand John, um, in the future.
Um, and so, yeah, coming coming out of the back of that, so it's this sort of final uh, answer to your question, is the mental health is a huge part of this. Um, absolutely, because your fin mental health is inherently linked to your financial health. And I remember at the start of this year, I was opening my laptop and I was so overwhelmed with the amount of work I had to do. I didn't, I couldn't even, I, I'd sit there five, six, seven, ten minutes, not understanding where I could even start. Um, and I think that's probably a sign of um, burnout. I don't know what the signs necessarily are. But where you sit there to the point of inaction, it's kind of like, wow, OK, this isn't this isn't what I, I started a business to end up being becoming. Um, and so I knew the signs are there and I thought, OK, so I've something's got to happen soon. And actually, my investor made that choice, um, which was great, rather than me kind of sitting on the fence. So I've come out of it and people I know have said you're a different person already or you feel like the weight of your world is off your shoulders so so uh yeah so that's that's the difference between seven years ago that's sort of very different I'm, I'm a very different person to about seven years ago um but i've learned a lot a lot in the interim <clears throat> there's a few questions i'd like to tackle before we we wrap up um but i just wanted to just go back to what you just said it's like can you, you're a different person to what you were seven years ago. Are you able to describe a couple of key differences that you feel beneficial difference? This is, let's put it this way, that you've, you've noticed or you've seen from when you started to where you are now. I think it's kind of, it's still, it's reinforced. Uh, look, I would not swap the last seven years for anything, uh, even though it's got to where you've got to. It's reinforced me what I want to do with my working life, which is basically be involved in sustainability or purpose. So that's great. And that's it's not it's, it's one of these things that we, we really need to be involved in anyway, I think more as a as a human race. But it's re really reinforced that for me. So that's great. And I've I've not come out tainted by the fact I mean, there's a lot of cynicism around sustainability, obviously, and, and as I've mentioned, all sort of greenwashing and the kind of what can I do about will we, you know, there's so much going on. Again, there's a the whole over, over, overwhelm there. But for me, I feel like that if I can do my small, small bit, and that's what Parler was about, making my, doing my small bit, my small way of, of creating change and impact. And, and for me, it was proof of concept in some respects that I can go out there and create something created change and I did that from a, a blank sheet um with any, without any experience so uh it's kind of given me confidence um I just need now to find that direction for my next my next phase whatever that looks like mm. awesome um I'm going to go to some of the questions that came up um you the, we might um be repeating a little bit of what you were just saying before but firstly uh cindy was asking a question about your investor um and how much they were invested in the purpose or the business idea and i assume is, is it purely the profit or was it also the purpose you know what are you able to say a bit more about that relationship uh yeah I, it's an interesting one so my um i can say it cause it's public so my investor was uh, the founder of asos <laughs> so Quite strange coming uh having an investor from a fast fashion background um and yeah i i think from him it, i was a bit of an antidote to his fast fashion empire and he invested in a number of businesses that were impact businesses uh, i know i wasn't the only one and uh, maybe it was his way of sort of light touch giving back and saw parlor as a as a as a brand back then seven or eight years ago quite a new that sort of felt quite a new and different thing to be doing, and he, he invested in in us for for that on that on that basis. And so, yeah, I think it was um, I think he wanted to make money there, uh, like any investor will do. Um, but I'm not sure he realised that how long it would take. To it wasn't like ASOS, which after a few years went stratospheric. Um, I think I've just seen someone else's comment. You know, especially with sustainable business, it just takes longer because all your costs are so much higher. And you're trying to do things well, and and um, yeah, it just it just is. Uh, it, it, say it's like the Finisterre example, or there's other brands too, mm. uh, where it just takes a long time to get get there. And maybe his patience ran out at the end, and he couldn't see the sort of the the vision that I had. Um, mm. 
and so so I would say a bit of both is that it's not a great answer, but I think a bit of, he was interested in the giving back and the the ethical purpose of the business. Um, but it was probably mostly to try and make money out of it as opposed to understanding if we could just get a business, a sustainable business that functioned as a nice little B Corp, which is what I wanted to do, a B Corp, where we, all our profits basically went back into the business and the giving back. But yeah, so slightly, but slightly different alignment there, maybe. Okay. Well, it's the the, uh, the the right answer if it's your answer. So thank you very much. Um, quick question on that. How, how did you find your investor? For those out there, it's like, oh, I'd love to find yeah, it. It's, a, it's right. a really, it's, it's not a great one. So he went to my school. Um, <laughs> no, but I didn't know him. He left when I got there, if that made sense. But I did see he was at, he was talking at a an event. Uh, and so I went to that event and I literally doorstepped him and he was guest speaker so i doorstepped him and said look you run asos i run an eyewear brand um can we just have a chat um and he said well here's my pa and i made a meeting and we got a meeting um and about nine months later sat in a cafe in clapham he um he said okay i'm, I'm in um so it's yeah. a slightly it's not the old school network but it did involve school so not the obvious route, unfortunately. I wasn't had to really pitch too much to somebody. So I was, I was very lucky to put it that way. Well, it's the power of serendipity, it sounds like there. Cool. Mm. Um, Lawrence, you had a... Oh, no, I was going to say, Cindy met her, met her investor in a bar. So it seems like high school is, is the way forward. Who needs platforms? <laughs> uh, quick question here from... Sarah. Well, maybe not so quick question, but a question here from Sarah. She came interested in what purpose means. Uh, and leaning towards it just being about being me, not just about work. So I think let's, start, let's answer it from the perspective. What does it mean? What does purpose mean to you? How do you define purpose? I mean, for me, it's 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 providing value beyond my own livable existence. So it's it's I I feel very privileged. I'm a classic white male 50s person um i think uh it's up to me to be able to help less advanced or more disadvantaged people in if, in whatever capacity that looks like so for me purpose is doing stuff outside my immediate ecosystem and and it can be anything it could be anything and how what that looks like i i human impact tends to be the space i'm more interested in rather than environment but environment inherently with parlor it was it was all about eco products and stuff. So it kind of comes hand in hand. It's like the V Corp values really um, of, of sustainability and, and environment. So um, yeah, outside of work, I just, I make my own personal decisions on, you know, I, I walk everywhere. I, 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 I don't use, you know, I use back, you know, recycle back all the kind of things that you'd expect, but try and do more. I buy, maybe three or four items of clothing a year. I, 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 have, I have my own personal standards and that all type for me types rolls back into purpose because it still impacts the environment and social impact too and who I buy my clothes through and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it just tends to be uh, trying to think more laterally about my decision, my own personal decision uh, decisions. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, John. Um, we have now, yeah, come to the end of our conversation uh, thank you everyone who took part in your comments and just your attention and hearing this story of john um is there anything uh, any final thoughts you want to leave with people and a little bit of prompt here like ray had a question about whether per being on purpose so much of the time results actually results in happiness. And he seems to see there's lots of evidence to suggest it does not. But um, just, you know, don't have to answer that directly. But that's, that was a curious comment there. Any well, final thoughts from you? What I've noticed in your, your um, these casts before is that you always have people who've got great quotes and all this kind of stuff. And I did set one aside. Um, <laughs> I'll have to read it because I'm terrible at memorizing, as you can see from this conversation. I've forgotten the stuff halfway through speaking. Um, but I've been listening to a, a podcast recently, and it's Dr. Rangan Chatterjee. And I don't know if people know about this guy. He has a podcast. I mean, there's a woman he uh, speaks with called Bronnie Ware, 
um, who's written a book, um, and it's called um, it's top something along the lines of the top five regrets of uh, the dying. And she spent eight years uh, in hospitals dealing with end of life patients. And there's a podcast she speaks with Dr. Rangan Chatterjee. And the number one thing that people, uh, number one regret was, I wish I lived life true to myself, not the life expected of me. Um, and that for me is a really, uh, that to me probably answers a lot of those questions. But for me, that is, that's so important. That's kind of how I am trying to move forward to my own life. It's, I don't worry about what other people's expectations. What, what, what on my deathbed will I look back and feel that I mm. actually lived my life um, to the fullest? Because ultimately, when you're on your bed, on your deathbed, you're going to be the only judge of your your life. And um, the second, actually, the second, um, second. I wish it didn't was, work so hard. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So, so that would be my recommendation. If you haven't heard that pod, uh, that podcast, uh, it's brilliant. It's uh, I've played it two or three times to myself now, and I just mm. pick up new things each time. But it's that has been a real help for me in the last six, seven weeks coming out of this space um, is just kind of being just just being kinder on myself. You put a lot of pressure on yourself running your own business. And I think uh, and you have a lot of expectations. But actually, we did a bloody good job with Parlour and we've got legacy to show for it. And I'm happy with that. And I can now move forwards and do something even better. And so that's mm. um, that's that's what I wish for. Wonderful. Thank you. Amazing. Perfect answer. Up there with all the greats on the Friday Five. <laughs> <laughs> you will now Lawrence. be an Instagram quote. Yeah. We'll make that quote. <laughs> Anything Great. from you, Lawrence? Any final reflections from the conversation? Well, yeah, for me, I, well, there's no simple answer to that question, is there? But it feels to me there's, there is that tension, certainly in your story, of wanting to do good, but also almost your own needs coming last and and how that I think we can do that for a while but to do it over an extended time frame where you haven't got a guaranteed end it feels like that's why I think it's, it takes a lot of courage to then go actually yeah this isn't failure at this end this is just an evolution and whatever comes next will will be more you or more in tune to how you want to live your life but it feels to me you're in that startup mode for a long time and that hustle to do that for seven years, I can see why that would be um, something that you just couldn't keep going for. Um, so yeah, in, in some ways, it's uh, good to sort of admit that and be aware of it and then move on. And it sounds like already you're getting benefits from it. Yeah, well, it's part of a celebration. And in the last six weeks, all the stuff you've seen is we're celebrating Parler as opposed to it being, and, and um, mm. so I know this is good. One of the things I did was a video <laughs> of all the people in and around Parler. It wasn't me, just me or Kaylee that worked it. And we did, we, I probably got about 25 people just saying thank you because I wanted our yeah, customers so to understand the wider people, the value of the network, the value of people. And I know there's people who are watching this who have provided me amazing value for nothing. Uh, which is what you need as a startup is just people helping. And I think when you're in a sustainable bit of space, they are far more willing to help. And when they're seeing what you're trying to do, they're far more willing to help. So um, it's that's been an incredible thing for me too. And I wanted to, to people to know that Parler isn't just me or whatever. It's a huge empire of people out there who have mm. helped. And even you, Carlos, you know, we've had conversations, people who can just, you can have half an hour with, it's been fabulous. And, and that network hasn't disappeared. And that's what instills me with confidence going forward is that I've, oops, I've got this opportunity to, to really ignite that still and, and create something great off the back of that. And, you know, watch this space, see what happens next. Mm. Awesome. Watch this space. Brilliant. <laughs> um, there's three things that is coming to mind. The very kind of practical side of things is, is the money aspect. And what I heard was like, if you were a traditional business, for want of a better term, you can just squeeze down costs, squeeze down costs, and then you can make a profit and you can stay around. But if you're, if you can't compromise on that, if that isn't something you are prepared to do, then where does the where does the space come from? What 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 do you do there, and how does that happen? 
whether that's story, whether that's customers, whether that's scale, I don't know. But there's a real question for people who are purpose driven. If you're not going to compromise here, what do you need to do here? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really mm -hmm. curious as to that question. Um, the other aspect to this was this idea of um, being true to yourself. Uh, and the question I think a lot of people I meet, um, and even to myself, my own question I ask, what does that mean to be true to myself? Yeah. How much of this is me? How much of this is a need to please someone else? It's like there's that journey of self-awareness so that we then can do work that is really authentic as opposed to serving someone else's need, which is a curious question for me. I think a lot of people would ask themselves. And then the third thing is this deathbed part of thing, you know, looking back, what you know, what is success? What does success mean to me? Um and part of what I heard is there's this idea of richness, a rich life. And and one way of thinking about rich life is a life full of stories, mm. full of really interesting stories. And there's an Instagram post someone shared with me is like, no risk, no story. And so mm. what I've heard is you, you took a big risk over the past seven years and you did so many things and you have so many stories. And now you have a richness that you can bring forward to, to whatever comes next. So that's my reflection on that. Thank you very much for really sharing honestly, like everyone's saying, your, your honest story about what, where, you, how you got to where you are now and, and looking forward to what comes next. Um, mm -hmm. For those of the listeners who are either came live or will be listening to the podcast, if they wanted to reach out to you and just find out more and maybe connect with you, learn from you maybe, and they want to pick your brains and, and yeah. Yeah, Take absolutely. I mean, it's probably LinkedIn. I'm about, I'll be losing my email address. John Pritchard is probably type in parlor I wear. I should come up by default um, somewhere, or if you want to pop it out in a post note, um, Carlos, that's fine. Um, but yeah, by all means, um, look me up and uh, very happy to help uh, where I can. And I, I think with Cindy, uh, I might have a few connections for you in the pet space. So uh, do get in touch. Mm. Boom. There you go. So the John's uh, LinkedIn profile is in the chat on Crowdcast. If you are watching here and the recording on Crowdcast, uh, and if you can listen to the podcast, we'll stick it in the show notes so you can reach out to John. Brilliant. Awesome. Thank you very Thanks, much Jim. again. You take you care. Both. Have a great rest of the day. And yeah, don't work this weekend, please. I'm not. <laughs> all rugby this weekend. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> There's no bank holidays. It's all good. All good. Bye-bye. Right. See you, everyone. everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.